Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This week I am into a theme, like I was talking about a couple weeks ago. Sometimes I go through themes in which I'm looking for books about a certain thing. And this time the theme is Russia and Russian writers. Now, because Russia has been in the news a lot, I've been going back and reading a lot of the great Russian literature. In English, of course, uh, by people like Tolstoy and Chekhov and uh, Dostoevsky. Pretty fascinating. But I thought, I want to see who is the most acclaimed Russian sci-fi writer in the post-Soviet era. And one of the names that came up was Sergei Lukyanenko. His most famous series is called The Watch. And it's not this kind of watch. It's the other kind. Before I continue, I have a couple messages I have to say. First of all, thank you to my family for these wonderful gifts, which I am wearing right now. For my sister, I got this new vest, very fancy, very, uh, you know, elegant and western. Uh, this bolo tie with a watch body in it, and more prominently, this hat from Mrs. Desperado, and granddaughter Alice helped her put it together and pick all the cool things, especially uh, the peacock feather. The second thing I have to say, it's been a long time since I've done any steampunk reviews, and I was going to do one on the top ten steampunk short stories. However, you know, the span of reading these has been a few years, and I really needed to have time to go back and review some and make sure I got the right ten. Didn't have time this week, so instead I decided to dive into something that I was doing right now, which is reading, or rather listening to, Lukyanenko's books. So I'm going to give a little bit of basis for this, and after that I'll talk a little bit about what happens in the books and so on. There may be some spoilers, but I'll keep them to a minimum because I think I want people to, you know, read these and judge for themselves. So first of all, it is a urban fantasy series, in a way kind of like an adult Harry Potter because it involves these um, people who live among us who are supernatural in nature but we don't know about them, and they are basically have this parallel society in plain sight, but invisible. It's also been compared to Jim Butcher's Dresden Files, in which he has a detective with magical powers who solves, of course, magical crimes. <laughs> and so it's a lot like that, too. But it's like Harry Potter in that there is this whole society, and they are called Others. They call themselves others because they're like human beings, but they're not. They were born to human beings, but they are a very small minority to develop these magical powers. And so they don't even consider themselves to be human, which is kind of odd. But they can have human spouses and human children that aren't always others. So it's kind of complicated. Uh, so there are two types of others. There's light others and dark others, and as you would expect, that's their ethical orientation. And so, in the case of light others, they want to help protect people and keep them safe and happy. And so they're kind of like these guardian angels behind the scenes, whereas the dark others, they want to exploit people. And, and included in the dark others, there are vampires and werewolves, are part of their number. And they're considered kind of on the low end of the totem, totem pole, but still... You know, they prey on humans. And in fact, all of them, including the light ones, sort of prey on humans because the magician types, which comprise the majority, they live off human emotion. In the case of the light others, it's positive emotion. In the case of the dark others, it's the negative emotions, you know, pain and fear and, and sadness and all that. <clears throat> so this explains why they feel so strongly about what they do. Although, you know, the Dark Others are more just kind of like sociopathic. It's more like they don't really care about people. They don't hate people, but they, but they really don't care about them. There is this treaty between these two groups, there, this kind of peace. And there's a, an organization that keeps the peace called the Inquisition, which comprises of members from each of the Dark and the Light Societies. The Dark and the Light Societies, they each have a watch which 
helps to enforce their own interest. In the case of the Light Others, it's called the Night Watch because they are active at night and they want to help protect people from vampires and so on, witches and other, other types that might harm them. In the Dark Others, it's called the Day Watch because they're active in the day and they want to keep the Light Others from doing too much good. Seriously, <laughs> because it has to balance. They're not allowed to just meddle so much in human affairs. And in fact, it's not as simple and black and white as you might think because the meddling of the light ones can sometimes be very harmful. In fact, and one of the things mentioned in the book is that one of the projects that the light ones uh, took it upon themselves was communism. <laughs> yes, the light ones decided they were going to create this utopian society and it didn't go well. <laughs> so, uh, so basically, the light ones are not 100% good. I mean, sometimes their desire to do good actually causes more harm than good. The dark ones, basically, they, they come out as libertarians. They, they say, we don't want these stultifying controls that these light ones put on us. We just want to live our lives as we see fit. And if we're vampires and we want to suck blood, well, that's just the way we are. Sorry. <laughs> but, you know, in order to keep the peace, they have this service where they'll give donor blood to vampires and so on. And I guess werewolves can live on meat very well, you know, of, of any sort of creature. The story focuses primarily on one character who's in the Night Watch, so he's a light magician. His name is Anton Gorodetsky. And he's an agent of the Night Watch. And it, the, the, these books follow his progress. He starts out, he's their IT manager, <laughs> basically. And the boss says, you're just sitting in the computer room. I want you to go out in the streets because you need to get some experience. You know, I think you have potential to be a more powerful magician because sometimes you can level up, but it's not under your power. It just happens, you know. He's out there on the streets and he encounters a vampire poaching. <laughs> so the upshot of this is that vampires and werewolves are granted licenses to kill people. Uh, they get a certain number, you know, for those who really can't help themselves, they have to pay this fee and they have to register and uh, they can take, call a certain number of humans. The light ones hate that, but it's kind of part of the agreement. But in this case, Anton encounters a unlicensed female vampire who is trying to suck the blood of this hapless young teenager who seems to have some kind of magical powers. He is an uninitiated other. And that's part of what happens in this world. If you have these powers, they don't always manifest right away. So the uh, watches are always looking for you. They're always looking for people who are not initiated, and they want to win them over for, to their particular watch, depending upon if you're more inclined to good or to evil. So this kid just happens to be an uninitiated other, and this vampire is going to kill him, and Anton saves him. And as the story goes on, we find out it's very much more interesting and there's a lot behind this, what has just happened. So, are there, so there are six books in the series. They're written from 2006 to, I think, to 2016. Uh, because, well, it's sometimes hard to tell on Amazon. They'll, they'll have the wrong date on, oh, this was the date of the audiobook, for example. And there were four written pretty close, one, one every year, pretty much. And then the other two came later. And I've noticed that some of the references say it's a four-book series. It sounds like they prevailed upon him to write two more because it was a popular series. Some of the publishers, uh, William Heinemann, Harper Books, and Seal Books. I'm not really sure who's the primary. I don't know who published them in Russia. The translator to English was Andrew Brownfield. He does a really good job. Everything's very understandable and, and smooth. And he keeps some of the Russianisms, which are fun, like calling each other by their full names, like, what are you saying, Barsik Naktovich? <laughs> that kind of thing. Most of these take place in Russia, and primarily in Moscow, because Anton's an, an agent of the Moscow Night Watch. But also, you know, in neighboring countries, a lot of post-Soviet countries like Ukraine and uh, uh, Uzbekistan. <laughs> and uh, at, one, at some points they go into Europe proper, like into, into Czechia, they go to the Prague. It starts out in the late 1990s when things were pretty awful in Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union 
and uh, proceeds into the early 2000s when things started to get a little bit better, when the Russian government decided to clean up all those oligarchs who were exploiting the people. And it comes out a lot in this book because at the beginning, you know, a lot of things are shoddy and there's a lot of criminality, everybody's trying to shaft everybody else, and things seem to get better as the books proceed because the years go by in the narrative. And the first book is Night Watch, second is Day Watch, which concerns the other side, third is Twilight Watch, fourth is Last Watch, those are the four I've read, and after that come New Watch and Sixth Watch, which I have not gotten to, but I probably will get them because it's an interesting series. In the first book, it contain, it basically concerns uh, Anton and his love interest Svetlana, who happens to be a very powerful female magician who nobody had realized that she was out there and not initiated. Uh, second book follows a dark other, a witch named Elisa, who gets herself into some trouble uh, from an unfortunate love affair. Third book, Twilight Watch, has some bits on the mechanics of this world. Uh, everything is underlied by the twilight. That's how human emotions flow into the others. The twilight underlies everything like another dimension and the magicians can travel through there and sometimes hide out from there if they need to get out of danger. But it's also, it is how this magical system works. And in in fact, sometimes the twilight itself will respond to disruptions in the equilibrium between the night watch and the day watch. And that's kind of what happens in Twilight Watch. Fourth book is The Last Watch, which involves a conspiracy to unearth this very powerful magical artifact. And it starts out with what looks like a garden variety murder, another unlicensed vampire attack. <laughs> uh, but uh, in this case, as always, it turns out to be more than you expected. And I really like the fact that Lukianenko can sometimes surprise me. Because after reading so many books, I can usually guess what's going to happen. And it's nice when they can fool you. Some of the things that are interesting in this. First of all, there's always a, this discussion of ethics. You know, because the light ones are so obsessed with ethics. And they have to justify their actions Sometimes when they have to kill in the line of duty, sometimes they get so upset that they just dissolve into the twilight. They can't live with themselves anymore. And uh, other times uh, they happen, as I said, doing more harm than good by their, by their efforts to do good. The characters are wonderful, and, and they're not one-sided. You know, even the, even the evil ones are fun, like the head of the Daywatch, who happens to be a demon. And some of these most powerful wizards are like thousands of years old, including uh, Anton's boss. He's like at least 1,500 years old. And so others tend to, look, tend to live very long lives, which is tragic for them when they are born to a human family or they might have a human spouse and children who grow old and die while they're still young. One of the things I love about this book and non-American literature in particular is there's no tokenism like you would see in a modern book. It's not that I have any problem with diversity, it's as long as it's organic to the story. In this case, yeah, there's there are some minorities appear, but they're minorities that make sense, like Uzbeks <laughs> in, in Russia. And so they will crop up now and then. This being a Russian book, there are no LGBT characters. Sorry, folks. You know, I don't think the audience in Russia really wants that. And uh, this was written well before the Russia's dumb gay propaganda laws. You know, so this was entirely the writer's choice. As a point of fact, <laughs> there was a case where Anton has to borrow a female magician's body. So they have to swap bodies. Basically, he's being pursued, and to throw them off the track, they swap bodies. And so she is a ancient but beautiful <laughs> magician. She goes to, or rather he, Anton, goes out to hide out with his girlfriend in this female magician's body. And as an American male reading this, I'm thinking, hmm, interesting scenario. Well, guess what? Nothing happens. <laughs> because 
even the light others aren't really prudes, they do have affairs and so on, but at the same time, Anton is such a good guy, he's so moral that he would never exploit somebody else's body on a whim, if you know what I mean. Even so, the writer doesn't even go there. So it, it, it's, it's kind of interesting because an American writer definitely would have gone, especially a man, definitely would have gone there. But I do love that this series has a lot of exciting action, a lot of you know gunfights and magical battles and peril. Uh, sometimes a important character gets killed. And, and I remember there was this one favorite secondary character of mine who just suddenly got killed in this really dumb, senseless battle. And I was like, no! And I was actually depressed for the rest of the day. And this is my favorite character. I wouldn't say who it was. Anything can happen, which is, which is good. And there's a lot here about concepts like family and loyalty and love of country. And uh, which is nice, too. It's refreshing in this day when everybody's so cynical. And at the same time, you know, you do have romance, you do have a little bit of erotic intrigue here and there, and you, you do have fun and stupid jokes and, and kind of a dry humor that I found myself laughing out loud a lot. In particular, I love this one scene where, and I don't remember if it's Anton or it might have been one of the other characters, he's in Prague, in, in Czechia, and he encounters this American airman who's there, I guess he's stationed there, who happens to be another also. And the airman recognizes his fellow other and he approaches him, hello brother, well, you know, and uh, so you're from Russia, right? And so he says, wasn't it cool how we pulled your chestnuts out of the fire in World War II? <laughs> he's such a jerk. And you know, the Russian is kind of polite, but he's thinking, what an ass. You don't realize that we lost like 10 million people in that war, literally? And uh, you lost, what, half a million, maybe? And not to denigrate anybody's sacrifice, but seriously, if anybody beat the Nazis, it was the Russians. So, another thing I have to address. Anton's character is a, is a music buff. Um, probably Lukianenko is himself. And he's always listening to music. He's always got this player with him. Starts out as a disc player. Becomes an MP3 player later in the later books. And he's always quoting these lyrics of these Russian pop bands none of whom I'd ever heard of, but uh, one of them I looked up uh, called Nautilus Pompilius. Yeah, it's a real thing, and the, the name comes from a scientific name of a mollusk. <laughs> so unfortunately, unfortunately, I can't understand the lyrics, but it's not bad. So, yeah, he does mention Russian pop music, and it's kind of an interesting way to get into that uh, if, you, if you want to pursue that. Finally, I have to address the elephant in the room, and the elephant's name is Edgar. Just kidding. But Edgar says, what about the war? <laughs> what about the Ukraine war? And this has caused Lukianenko a little grief because he's a patriotic Russian and he supports it. He's very, he's very uh, outspoken about that. And, you know, a lot of Americans have been saying, well, let's boycott Russian chess players and let's boycott Russian opera singers and all that because we expect them to support our side because we're right and they're wrong. Well, you know what? It's it's kind of a matter of perspective, and and really to to expect somebody to betray their own side because we think we're right is very very arrogant and hypocritical in my view. So it's a huge sacrifice to go against what your country's doing, and it is very presumptuous to expect somebody to do that because of your own views. Don't judge Lukyanenko on the actions of his country. That's not right. As for rating, I really enjoyed this series of books, the four I've read so far out of the six. And I was tempted to take off a little bit for the stylistic issues. Uh, Lukianenko can be a little wordy in places. If there's a lot of things that are considered taboo these days, like using a lot of adjectives or, or having a lot of explanation in the narrator's voice rather than showing them. It's not really bad, and you get used to it. Some of it's necessary. Some of that extra explanation is necessary because of the very complex situation that the character's in. And furthermore, the philosophy is part of the book. Anton is always worrying about whether this is ethical or not, and uh, so on. And that's part of his character. So I won't take off any for that. I will give this series, so far, five out of five gears.
a rating I seldom give. In other words, I really, really like this and I highly recommend this. And again, as I said, do not penalize Lukinenko for his government. And maybe they won't penalize us. <laughs> because it's the same thing, right? Please let me know what you think about this video in the comments below. And please give me any other suggestions you'd like to give about what other things to review. Please like and subscribe because that helps us get out the good steampunk word. And for now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. Thank you.